We're going to go to prayer right now. It's going to be the first pastoral prayer of 2023. And I think it's a good thing to remember what we're doing. Uh, we are a body. We are here collectively. Many of our body are other places. Some of them are home sick. Some are on the road traveling. But we're one body. And as a body of believers, we are uniting right now. And we're going to the throne of grace. We are actually going to pray. And the recipient of our prayers and our petitions is God the Father Almighty. And we come to him in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we come to him in the power of the Holy Spirit. And when we come weekly, not just in this pastoral prayer, but the prayers for the offering, our prayers in our small groups, we are coming to the very throne room of God, which means it's serious business. It's an unspeakable privilege. It's a wonderful opportunity, but it's an awesome responsibility as well. So join me as we pray for this service, and let's beg the Lord to do in this service what he hopes to do and what he plans to accomplish in our lives. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the year that has passed, 2022, a year of great blessing, a year where many joined this flock officially and became members, a year where you brought us through some fiery trials, a year in which you brought us great joy. We thank you for children who were born in 2022. We pray your blessing upon those young lives, that their parents would rear them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We thank you for the memories of those who departed us in 2022. We pray that you would continue to comfort those families. We thank you, Father, for everything you brought into our lives and to the life of this congregation corporately in 2022. We know it's from your sovereign and gracious hand because you love us and you have accepted us as your children in the beloved Jesus Christ. We pray for 2023, and Father, we know that in some senses it's artificial to even recognize the transition of years because we're coming before the throne room of the one who is the king of all ages, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And we thank you that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are everlasting, eternal, without beginning, without end. But Father, it is a milestone, and we pray that in 2023, most importantly, we as a flock would grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would be discipled in the word, that we would be light in a dark world, that we would be advocates and ambassadors and evangels to those who don't know Jesus Christ. And I pray, Father, that we would be serious about your word in reading it and learning it, hiding it in our hearts, that we would be serious about the proclamation of your word and the digestion of your word. And I pray that we would grow numerically according to your plan, according to your will, but we pray that we would grow spiritually and continue to sink deep roots into the soil of your grace. Now, Father, we thank you for those who've met here on this holiday. I thank you for their willingness to be among God's people and to participate in the life of the church. And I pray for each individual here that we would individually see accomplished in our lives the purposes that you planned for this service. And that as a body, we would be further united in Christ Jesus, our head, our Lord, our friend, and our coming King. Father, we thank you for Gary, and we thank you for raising him back up from a very serious illness and I thank you that he's with us today, and I praise you for that. I pray for others who are out today because of illness, and there are many. I pray that you would heal them and bring them back to us as soon as possible. And again, for our friends and family members who are traveling, would you bring them home to us safely, and we thank you for the time of recreation you gave them. Father, meet with us as we seek your face, and you've promised that if we seek you with all our hearts, we will be found of you, you will reveal yourself to us, and you will make known your wondrous plans for us, which are indeed marvelous. We ask all this in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand and continue our worship.
Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the life that you've given us. Lord, we thank you that we can entrust to you uh, our care in every area of life. We thank you that you are a great provider. And we ask that as we uh, give, give our tithes and offerings this year, uh, that you would use them for your glory and the glory of your kingdom, that you would use them for the advance of the gospel, uh, for the needs of this family. Uh, and we ask, Lord, that you would work through your word and work through your spirit to grow us more and more into the likeness of Christ. We thank you for the opportunity this year uh, to look into your word, to hear it proclaimed in our presence, to increase our faith and our commitment. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel of John, the first 18 verses. You may recognize that we read these verses last week. This is not a misprint, uh, this is intentional. Uh, we're going to focus in our weekly scripture reading as a congregation on the Gospel of John this year, and I think about 50 of the 52 weeks of the year we'll be reading a portion from the Gospel of John so that by the end of the year we will have read through that Gospel as a congregation. So, let's go to John chapter 1, beginning of verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. 
He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Good singing.
Turn, please, in your Bibles to the book of Philippians, chapter 1. A word about our preaching schedule. Uh, Next week, we will pick up uh, and begin the remaining sermons from our Hebrews series. And then we're going to tackle a rather audacious project. We're going to preach through the book of Deuteronomy. Oh, no! Deuteronomy! No! Uh, We're going to preach through Deuteronomy in big chunks. And I'm planning about... uh, one chapter per sermon, and the series is entitled The Gospel According to Moses. So we're going to really look at God's grace as it's manifested in the book of Hebrews. Philippians 1, beginning verse 12. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet Which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Joseph Addison once famously wrote, three grand essentials to happiness in this life are something to do, something to love, and something to hope for. Largely, I think Addison is correct in this assumption. But Christians of all people know the deeper truths associated with something to do, something to love, and something to hope for. All those three terms, do, love, hope, are wrapped up in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Because he loved us, we have something, someone, to love. Because he is our Lord and Master and gracious King, we all have something to do. And we do it in true Christian hope. You've heard me say, you've seen it written elsewhere, the New Testament concept of hope is unlike the modern vernacular version of that term. We say, I hope the Ohio State kicker makes his 50-yard field goal. He didn't, and the game was over. That concept of hope is, I really would like this to happen, but it might not. The New Testament concept of hope is far different. It is an absolute assurance that what God has promised will come to pass. We know that it hasn't fully come to pass because you hope for that which you wait for. You don't hope for that which you already have. Now, in some senses, we do already have it. We do dwell in the already not yet. But in many ways, we have not yet attained to the thing that Christ has promised us. 
Now in this passage in Philippians, which I'm going to use more as a springboard to two other passages a little later in the book, Paul is writing essentially a thank you letter to the church at Philippi for gifts that they sent to him through their servant Epaphroditus. You know the founding of the church at Philippi. Paul, on a missionary journey, goes to Philippi. There are converts there, including the jailer who put him in prison for a while. He was beaten along with Silas. You know the story. God miraculously delivered them from the prison. And a church was formed. Since that time, Paul has had very little to do with that church in terms of actual visitation, but he loves them dearly. And now Paul has subsequently been arrested for his faith, and he is in jail, I believe, in Rome by this time, because he speaks of chains. He speaks of the royal the royal household, which I take to mean the uh, actual palace guard. So Paul's in jail. The Philippian church love Paul dearly. They send him gifts. They send him things that are necessary for him. A first century prisoner in a prison was not supplied things like clothing or even sometimes food. Uh, that prisoner was dependent upon people outside the prison providing those things for him. That's what happens. So Epaphroditus, a very faithful servant, at the church of Philippi, brings this gift, and Paul is then writing them a thank you letter, and that's pretty much what Philippians is. Thank you for your gifts. But Paul, being Paul, is not going to leave it as a thank you note. He's going to use it as a springboard to teach them deep theological truth about the person and work of Christ, and also to give them instructions along these concepts of do, love, hope. Of course, you know that the key word of Philippians is the word rejoice, or versions of the word joy, rejoice. And there's also the concept of hope, rejoicing in hope, that what we wait for in Jesus Christ, the culmination of all things, that which we look forward to, we now enjoy in part, but we will fully partake of in full later on. And that's what we hope for. Bishop Mole writes of these verses, we have still in our ears the celestial music, infinitely sweet and full, of the great paragraph of the incarnation, the journey of the Lord of love from glory to glory by way of the awful cross. Mole is referring to the first 10 verses, the first 11 verses of chapter 2. So you might move your finger over to chapter 2 of Philippians. And the first 11 verses of chapter 2 are this magnificent statement about the humiliation of Christ and the exaltation of Christ culminating in the notion that every knee will bow before this Christ and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Mole goes on to write, May we not now give ourselves a while wholly to reverie and feast upon the divine poetry at our leisure? Not so. The immediate sequel is that we are to be holy. We are to act in the light and wonder of so vast an act of love in the wealth and resource of so great salvation. We are to set spiritually to work. What is Mole talking about? In chapter 1, what we just read, Paul is talking to them about this hope. He's telling them, don't be discouraged because I'm in prison. In fact, my imprisonment has actually resulted in the gospel going forth in ways that I could not have done had I not been in prison including the gospel going forth into the household of Caesar himself. And he says, people, because of my imprisonment, out of sincerity, are preaching the gospel even more fervently. And yeah, you've got some kind of Judaizing crowd, and they hope to put some more affliction in my bonds, and they're preaching the gospel for that purpose. Paul says, I don't care. Big whoop. Whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, I'm going to rejoice in that. Yea, I will rejoice. So he's saying to the Philippians, I know you feel bad about my imprisonment. I know you're discouraged about what I might be going through. I know these chains that I bear distress you. But don't lose heart. I'm going to rejoice because the gospel is preached. And he goes on to say, it's my eager expectation and hope, that's our word, that I'm not going to be ashamed. I'm not going to be put to shame, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Not only am I not concerned as to who's preaching the gospel as long as the gospel is preached, I'm not really concerned about whether I live or die. All I am concerned about is that I'm not going to be put to shame. My gospel will be validated. 
and it'll be further validated either by my life to continue preaching with you or by my death. And he goes on to assure them that to me, to live. Notice that it's, you have two twos there. We often misquote this verse, 21. For to me, to live is Christ. We often say what? To live is Christ, to die is gain. Paul is saying, wait a minute, that's not all I'm saying. My settled personal conviction, my absolute faithful hope is that to live is Christ and to die is gain. And the first to me indicates I have appropriated that truth. I have taken into myself that hope of glory. I have made it a settled personal conviction to me that this is true. To continue to live is actually Christ. And even if I die, it's glory. Now he does assure them that the Lord has revealed to him, he says, I'm in a strait betwixt two. Good old King James phrase. I don't know what to do here. Because I know to die is a whole lot better. Now, do we really, I don't think sometimes we really believe that. I still think we have kind of a pagan streak in us that says the worst thing that could possibly happen is death. When you think about it, the best thing that could possibly happen is death, if we really have this hope. I mean, is heaven not going to be better than this? Folks, if you're trusting your best life now, ding, 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 you're trusting a false gospel. It's not the best life now. Paul says, I know it's far better, but I also know something else that to stay here in the flesh is really going to be more encouraging for you. And he says, I know, convinced of this, I know, I have faith, I have hope, that I am going to continue with you all, and I'm going to do it for the progress of your joy and your faith, and that we together will have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus, because I'm going to come to you again. Paul was convinced, probably of the Holy Spirit, perhaps through a vision, he was convinced I'm not going to die yet. My work is not finished. Now we know if we put all the pieces together in that puzzle that is Paul's life, I believe he was indeed subsequently released from this imprisonment. That the imprisonment and subsequent death that we see uh, talked about in 2 Timothy, for example, is after Paul was released from this imprisonment. He did continue to bring glory to the Lord through his life, even though he was convinced to die would actually be better. Now, back to chapter 2, in verse 12. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Two dominant truths this morning that will be gone. Those who have the boldness of hope articulated in chapter 1, actually work. And I mean, they work. They do stuff. As Addison says, they have something to do. Now, what Bishop Mole is saying is, you would expect after Philippians 2, 1 through 11, which is this glorious, glorious hymn of praise about the risen Christ and the glorified Christ, you would expect the next passage to be something, as Mole says, we need to stop and ponder that, and let's get that in our hearts and minds and our souls, and let's just sit around and go to the campfire and sing kumbaya, whatever we end up doing. Oh, that's great. Paul says it's wonderful. You should actually get Philippians 2, 1 through 11 into you and understand that you have to have this mind in you. But Paul doesn't take us through that for impractical purposes. In context, that great passage of Philippians 2, 1 through 11, leads to this. On the basis of that, so then, verse 12, as you've always obeyed, not only in my absence, my presence, but even now in my absence, you work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For this, it is God who is at work in you. The concept of people who understand who Jesus Christ really is, who understand where we're going, who know that there's coming a time when every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. People who have that hope in them 
Yes, they meditate on it, but they go to work. They now have something to hope for and indeed something to do because they have someone who loves them and is the love that, that someone gives to us has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So we have something to do. We have someone to love. We have some place to go because we have hope. And that place we go to immediately is we set ourselves to work. Now, what are some implications for this first passage, which teaches us that those who have the boldness of hope actually work? Well, obviously, it's addressed to Christians. Paul is by no means telling unsaved people how to be saved. That's not what this passage is about. He's not telling anyone that salvation is earned by working for it. The prevailing and great lie of human history is this, that a man or a woman can attain eternal life through human effort, that salvation results from good deeds, that salvation can be earned by personal acts of righteousness. That is categorically, absolutely false. And that's not what Paul is telling this group of people. When he tells them to work out their salvation, he's telling them to work through that which they already possess in Jesus Christ. He's asking them through obedience and in the power of the Holy Spirit to live that life that has been redeemed, that has been bought back, that has been saved. Live that life in accordance with God's word, which Paul calls obedience. Another implication is that Paul just loved these Philippians. He loved this church. These are believers in Christ that Paul is in the process of discipling, particularly through those who serve with Paul. Another implication is Paul wants these Philippians to continue in what he calls obedience. They have been consistent in obedience when the apostle, the apostle was there. He now wants them to continue in obedience when he's absent. Notice the way the passage works. So then, but now. He says, so then, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, but goes on to say, but now, what do you do? In my presence, you work out your own salvation. There's a fourth implication, and the central one for us on this New Year's Day. Salvation is a gift from God that meets the greatest human need. You're working out your salvation because it has been given to you. And having been given to you, you now put it to work. You don't create it. You don't manufacture it. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, you live it. D.A. Carson said, if God had perceived that our greatest need was economic, he would have sent an economist. If he had perceived that our greatest need was entertainment, he would have sent us a comedian or an artist. If God had perceived that our greatest need was political stability, he would have sent us a politician. If he had perceived that our greatest need was health, he would have sent us a doctor. But he perceived that our greatest need involved our sin, our alienation from him, our profound rebellion, our death, and he sent us a savior. Because the word Paul uses here, work out your own salvation, the word salvation is a nuanced word. It basically means deliverance, but specifically deliverance from that which is imminent. In other words, you've been delivered from something, and if you don't get delivered from it, the rock is going to fall on you. And we use this term in sports, primarily in baseball. We record the efficacy of what we call relief pitchers on the basis of a term called saves. And a save in baseball is this. A relief pitcher comes in for the starting pitcher, and he comes in with his team in the lead. And the measure of a relief pitcher is, did he keep the lead? And if he keeps the lead to the end of the game, then he records what's called a save. And the concept of save there is, was there a chance we could lose the game? Yes. If I don't pitch well, we're going to lose the game. Right on. If I pitch well and we retain the lead, then I have saved the game. In a certain sense, that's what salvation is in scripture. 
you have been rescued from something that was on the horizon which could actually crush and destroy you. So what Paul is saying is, you need to work this out. God saved you by his grace. Make no mistake about it. You did not work to earn it. You did nothing to conceive of it. You were an alien and a stranger and a rebel, and you were shaking your spiritual fist in God's face. And God says, I will save you. And he puts in place a plan of salvation all the way to eternity past, and he calls you by his grace, and he saves you by washing you in the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And you had nothing to do with it except believe. That's the message Paul gives. Except, he says, work it out. Work out that which you have already received. And one truth we want to have for 2023 is this. It's another implication of this passage. We work out our salvation within the corporate life of the church. You might think that as pastor, I've got this as a hobby horse. It's not a hobby horse. It is absolutely true. We work out this plan of salvation in our lives because we are working it out together. All the pronouns in verses 12 and 13 are plural. It's more than one person. And we've placed so much emphasis on individual sanctification and spiritual growth that we ignore the truth that these are worked out in the life of the church. One theologian, Gordon Fee, concludes that the passage is a call to individually work out our common salvation in our life together. Yes, you are individually called to work this thing out. And you're called to do it alongside other people who have likewise been called to work this salvation out. You don't have to do it alone. And in fact, you were not designed to do it alone. Another writer puts it this way, in short, the appeal to unity is based on what God has already done and is doing in them and in their midst to bring about their salvation. Working out salvation means, among other things, continuous, strenuous effort working harmoniously together as the body of Christ. And you're going to hear me say a lot about that this year. You've already heard me say a lot about it. Notice this plural thing. Well-known verse, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. Let's walk through that. Do you, plural, not know that your, plural, body, singular, is a temple, singular, of the Holy Spirit who is in you, plural, whom you, plural, have from God, and that you, plural, are not your, plural, own? You have two singulars, the body, and the temple. And the rest of them are plural. All of you together are working this way. And all of you together are the recipients of this grace. Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians 1, 10 to say, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. And this is one of the reasons why I'm coming to hate the internet. I like the internet, it's fine. I do a lot of work on the internet. But like I hear people come to me and say, you know, I came across this pastor and he said so and so on the internet. I'm like, please, don't do that anymore. Just stop, just turn it off, whatever. I'm not saying I'm your only source of information. There are some good sermons to be found on the internet. Please understand, I'm not saying that. I go and consult them. But what happens is people wanna go off in a hermitage that is their den or their sofa, and they click on stuff and they consider that fellowship with the church, when in reality it really isn't. This is fellowship with the church. And we together corporately come to know what is the mind and heart of God. And we then are connecting ourselves with the larger church. But the connection is not made by individuals going out and being Lone Ranger or Lone Rangeress. The connection is made by us corporately together thinking through these things. 
And that's why Hebrews tells us in chapter 10, we consider how we may spur one another on to love and good deeds. Folks, if you have this hope, which is audacious, to borrow from a former president, an audacious hope, you work this thing out in conjunction with other believers who are in your flock. The Heidelberg Confession, Catechism, question 55 is this. What do you understand by the communion of saints? The answer is first, that all and everyone who believes being members of Christ are in common, partakers of him and of all his riches and gifts. Secondly, that everyone must know it to be his duty readily and cheerfully to employ his gifts for the advantage and salvation of other members. And we have another implication. We collectively work out salvation in a deep reverence for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We don't ignore chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Notice what he says. You work this out with fear and trembling. The Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uses these words to indicate a level of terror, as in Psalm 55. This is serious business. We might call it reverential awe to best describe it. It's not an abject cowing fear. He is our Father, and we receive from him loving, gracious gifts on a daily basis. But as our Father, we have to have appropriate reverence and awe for his majesty, his glory, his dignity, and his sovereignty. And we bow the knee before the one who is all-powerful, all-knowing, absolutely pure, who is truly awesome in the original and best sense of that term. That's why Lloyd-Jones reminds us, the Christian is one who works out his salvation with fear and trembling, fear lest he should fail or falter, lest he should not discern the subtlety of the world, the power of sin and his own weakness, and the holiness of God. So he walks with gravity. Good word, look it up. He walks with gravity lest he should be unworthy of this great salvation. But we work also with full confidence that it is God who wills and works on our behalf. We work out our salvation trusting the one who is actually doing the work through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the ministration of his word. Yes, we labor. Yes, we go. Yes, we speak. Yes, we toil. But we know in our speaking and our toiling and our going that it's God who is actually at work. Do you gloss these terms sometimes? When I say gloss, I mean like, you know, you just kind of like, eh. Read it a million times. Oh, pastor wants me to memorize that. Okay, let's memorize it. For it is God who is at work in you. Think about that. It is God presently working inside of you. And what does he want to do? He both to will and to work his good pleasure. God gives you the ability to do and it is a God-given gift that you have the will to do it, that you want to do it. The desire to please God is not, in the fallen sense of the word, natural. In fact, your natural self, in terms of flesh, doesn't want to have anything to do with God. God is the one who inclines your heart toward him, draws you to him. And fully understanding that says, well, of course I'm going to work. God's working in me. I will absolutely do everything I can to glorify him and to help other people in Christ and to minister the word and to see souls saved because he's working. But there's a second truth that the first chapter indicates to us that Paul fleshes out a little bit more in the book. Those who have the boldness of hope work and those who have the boldness of hope also wait. Those are not mutually con exclusive terms. It's not oxymoronic to say the one who works waits. Philippians 3, let's look at verses 17 through 21. Brethren, join in following my example. 
and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Paul says, okay, I'm giving you an example of how to live, including being imprisoned. I want you now to apply that example and take a look around you. I want you to be, have this as a pattern. By the way, that is a bold statement in and of itself. To live a life of consistency to where you can say to other people, follow me as a pattern. Live as I live. Verse 18, for many walk of whom I often told you and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. As a sidebar question, does it break your heart to see sin or does it just make you mad? Paul says, there are people out there who are not walking as you should walk. They're not working out their salvation. Indeed, they are lost and they have become enemies of the cross. And I say this to you, weeping. Can we make a you know, mutual New Year's resolution for 2023? Let's start with a very low bar. I will not throw my house slipper at the TV screen when I see something that bothers me. Let's just, can we get like, you know, real low level New Year's resolution. But Paul says, even when you see enemies of the cross, it breaks your heart. It breaks your heart. There are people standing in pulpits today that are preaching a false gospel who themselves are not saved and the people in front of them are probably not saved. And it makes me angry with Satan and satanic forces that keep them in blindness, but it should break my heart that that is indeed the case. Sidebar over. Verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is he going to do? He will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. The power that is evidenced in chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, before whom every thing that has ever been created will bow. That same body that same power is at work in you and will result in the transformation of your humble body so that it will be like his glorious body. Is it not magnificent what Christ is doing in us? I mean, we all, it's like, oh, wow, another new year, 2023, hard to imagine. When I was growing up, I thought 2023, we're all going to be living on Mars, surely. I mean, the Jetson thing will be a past tense. Um, do you ever think like that? I used to think like 2023, well, surely we'll be living you know, on the moon at least. But as time passes, what's supposed to be happening? Internally, in your soul and in your spirit, you should be more like Jesus Christ than you were one year ago today. And for most of us, we actually look less like Jesus externally than we did one year ago today. We're getting older. But in the plan of God, those things will come to an ultimate matchup, an ultimate continuum that forms itself into you being like Jesus Christ inside and out. Are you waiting for that? I mean, is that not what gets you out of the bed in the mornings? I'm becoming more like Christ internally. And there's coming a day when I'm going to be more like Christ externally. And I'm going to have a body like to his glorious body, this passage says. But notice this also in our closing moments. We wait as citizens of heaven. The Philippians would have gotten this really clearly. Philippi was a Roman colony. In past battles, um, when, they had, when the Caesars had won, uh, they would often take the city that was gained and they would make it a royal colony. 
And in this case, the emperor actually took people and had them come and settle in Philippi. And wherever they lived, wherever their house stood, it was considered to be Roman soil. They considered themselves citizens of Rome who happened to dwell in a colony that is possessed by Rome. But they're citizens of Rome. And is that not true of us? This working and this waiting takes place while we, as citizens of heaven, sojourn as citizens of this earth. Jesus is king. We are not citizens of a democracy. We're citizens of a monarchy. And this is why he can say, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who is in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ who will display at the proper time he who is the blessed and only sovereign King of kings and Lord of lords. You are in a colony And you've been asked to sojourn there. You've been asked to work there and to wait there. But there's coming a day when the Lord of all things and the Lord who owns all things will come back to your colony and he will call you to himself. And while you're here, you do what? You live a life that is unstained and free from reproach. A major reason we work out our salvation in fear and trembling in this corporate assembly in Greenville, South Carolina, is that we do not bring reproach upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the place of our citizenship. I saw a meme. One of the fans at one of the playoff games yesterday, no shirt on. This guy has no shirt on. Not his best choice. Let's just leave it at that. Not, no shirt on. And what else, you know, the meme was, this is the guy who's playing against Georgia. I think it was, a, you know, uh, Ohio State guy. He's got his no sh- shirt on. And the meme is, keep it classy, Georgia. It was, don't be like that. Don't go to ball games and take your shirt off and be an idiot. Well, that's a very, very, very ridiculous example of what I'm talking about. Don't work and wait and be an idiot while you're doing it so that the world thinks less of you and more importantly, they think less of Christ and the kingdom you represent. You live in such a way that representation points to the king and you become more like him internally and externally. So much more we could say about all these things. But I want to say, in closing, Happy New Year. Happy 2023. And what are we going to do? Well, we're going to contemplate our salvation, who we are in Christ and what Christ has done for us marvelously by his grace. Then, as God gives light through the scriptures and through the impression made on us by the Holy Spirit who enlightens the scriptures for us, we're going to work. And we're going to work at working out. And the working out is not going to the gym necessarily, it is actually taking that salvation and manifesting it in all of its attributes. So we work. And we do that knowing that it's God working in us and through us, and at the same time, we do it while we're waiting. And we're waiting for a couple of things, that our bodies will be changed to be like his glorious body so that we become fully like Christ inside and out, And we wait for the one who is our king, our sovereign, our Lord, who dwells in our true home, which is heaven, to come back and take us out of the colony and into our house. That's pretty much it, folks. Now, we won't check out for 2023. We've got a few other things to say. But is that not really what's going on? That you spend this year working out your salvation while waiting for the one who saved you. Let's pray. We thank you for Paul and the wisdom you gave him and the word that you gave us through him, authored by the Holy Spirit who still speaks through that word. I thank you for this flock 
and help us to understand what it means to work out our salvation corporately with and among these believers and help us to help each other to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Father, we love you because you first loved us. We thank you for giving us something to do and we thank you for giving us something to hope in. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.